the wonderful Lawrence Owen! Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Well, good. Now, as you know, as you know, we are approaching uh, perhaps the most, uh, a very, very, uh, did I just turn it off? No, it's on again. Good. Uh, a very magical time of year, perhaps the most, the most wonderful time of year. Uh, and that is, of course, uh, Star Wars The Force Awakens release season. Uh, which is, of course, a wonderful thing. But uh, lest we forget, 1999 was also Star Wars release season. <laughs> you better get on board, because the next ten minutes has a very strong theme, sir. <laughs> Too soon. It's always too soon. But nevertheless, I'm going to explain to you what happened. <laughs> Tom, could you do me the honours and play that track for me? This is the true story. It's ten minutes of this shit, so strap yourself in. It's a warm evening in the summer of 1971, and Steven Spielberg is sitting by the window in his Los Angeles home, watching the world go by. As the sun sets, casting an orange glow through the window of his apartment, Steven pictures a faraway desert world with two suns and a lone figure staring into the wide horizon. Soon, his imagination starts racing, and an entire universe materializes within his mind. A universe of strange worlds, creatures, religions, and epic battles of good and evil. His mind is ablaze with ideas, and he grabs the nearest pen and paper to capture it all before it slips away. This is a space adventure of astronomical proportions, and it could be huge, he thinks. But Stephen's just a newbie with no real reputation or funds. The space race is long over, the moon is conquered, maybe nobody cares about space anymore. And maybe he hasn't got the necessary Hollywood clout to carry this off yet. Would they laugh him out of the building? And so the project is shelved for now. Skip to 1974. The Sugarland Express is a critical success, and young Stephen wins high acclaim at the Cannes Film Festival. He now has three potential plans in the pipeline. Jaws, a psychological thriller about a great white shark. Close encounters of the third kind. A thoughtful, poignant science fiction piece about space first contact. And finally, his space adventure. It's kind of the odd one out, he thinks to himself. The universe is so huge, the concept so vast and unwieldy. What to do? Later that year, Stephen holds a meeting with composer John Williams, puppeteer Jim Henson, and special effects and animatronics guru Stan Winston. Together, they sit down and try to figure out how to get away with making this movie. After several hours, they come up with a solution. Spielberg directs, Williams makes the music, but Henson and Winston face a bigger challenge. In order to avoid a potential career suicide, Stephen enlists their help in creating an entirely new persona with which to make this movie. A name, a face, a personality for the blame to fall on if it all goes horribly wrong. <laughs> no self-respecting director would ever have gone for it. So Henson and Winston design and build a life-size and almost lifelike robot. Capable of performing simple social duties, such as interviews, press conferences, and so on. As long as the animatronics manipulating his body are always concealed between a, a table, a pedestal, or like a high-backed armchair or something. And the results are fantastic. He looks almost real. Now all he needs is a memorable name, an everyman name, but something that will iconically sit on a film poster. After much debate, they decide on the name George Lucas. <laughs> 1976. Production is underway on what has become known as Star Wars, and Steven is hard at work, jetting quickly between the Tunisia location and the close encounter shoot in Wyoming, where he is working as himself. The Lucas robot is wheeled around, appearing in production stills which will later appear in coffee table books if the franchise proves successful. All is going to plan. Filming finishes, and Star Wars enters post-production. The Lucas 
asteroid now spends most of its time in storage, as the team is no longer working out in the open. It looks as though they might just get away with this. In 1977, the movie opens, and the reception is rapturous. Star Wars is everywhere. The cinema queues stretch round the block, and everyone is clamoring to see this incredible new phenomenon from relatively unknown director George Lucas. The droid has fooled them, and the plan has worked like a dream. Work immediately begins on the following two movies, and the same process is repeated. The Lucas droid appears from time to time, soaking up the adulation of fans and critics alike. By the time Return of the Jedi is released in 1983, everybody involved is a millionaire. The original Lucas droid, worn and rusty, its task now completed, is decommissioned, and a number of newer, simpler models are built for public face. One of these models is even seen to be working alongside Steven himself, entirely out of the open, on an animated dinosaur feature called The Land Before Time, as well as the Indiana Jones trilogy, although Harrison Ford, to our knowledge, was never let in on the secret. <laughs> but unbeknownst to them, away from the limelight, deep within a locked-up Los Angeles prop hat, the original Lucas droid is still working. For 15 long years, the robot lies undisturbed, but teeming with malfunctions, corrupting and corroding its original commands and breaking its core program. It is becoming self-aware. <laughs> there, in that hangar, it concocts a horrified, mangled caricature of the vision Stephen had originally built into it. Hideous, mechanical plot devices, lengthy trade federation disputes, slapstick aliens with alarming racist undertones, excruciating dialogue featuring the use of sand as a metaphor for love, and an infuriating repetition of the pretty arbitrary catchphrase, I've got a bad feeling about this, whenever its rusty circuits cause it to stutter and stall. Until one fateful day in 1995, it decides its moment has come. The Lucas droid breaks free of its shackles and of its own free will walks straight into the 20th Century Fox main offices. Without Spielberg, Henson or Winston at the controls, it pitches independently three entirely new Star Wars films. <laughs> Imagine that! And of course the studio officials rub their hands with glee. Come 1997, production is in full swing on Star Wars The Phantom Menace. When Steven gets wind of it, horrified, he flies from the set of Saving Private Ryan to London to stop this disaster, but even he can't get close. It's a highly secretive operation and a closed set. He tries to contact Winston, but he's hard at work on Jurassic Park 2, The Lost World. He's unreachable, and the only other man who knew how to control the Lucas droid, Jim Henson, died of pneumonia in 1990. Coincidence? <laughs> yeah, probably. And so the Lucas droid plows on. Spielberg can do nothing but watch in horror as his beloved creation is trashed by the very foil he employed to save his skin. The terrible years roll on. Critics hate him. Fans are outraged. Jar Jar Binks happened. The Clone Wars happened. The moment at the end of Revenge of the Sith in which Darth Vader cries. That happened. Until in 2012. Stephen decides he can take it no longer. Yoda is advertising mobile phone networks on the London fucking underground. <laughs> Not even the Ewoks stooped so low. <laughs> and a lump in his throat, Stephen decides to call in the big guns. What's left to do when all else has failed you? The answer's plain. You phone Disney. <laughs> on the phone to CCO John Lasseter, Stephen, to his shame, recalls the entire sordid story. How he forfeited his dream and sacrificed everything and entrusted the fate of his masterpiece to an android designed to protect him. But Disney is a forgiving lord. Lasseter knows it could break him. After he's worked so hard to turn it all around after the 80s have brought us the fox and the hound. Jesus Christ. But if anything is worth staking everything on, it's the original Star Wars trilogy. We all remember where we were on the day that Luke Skywalker found out that Darth Vader was his father. Spoiler alert. And John fucking Lasseter was not about to let that moment die. In a record-breaking $4.05 billion buyout, Disney seized Star Wars from the demented Lucas droid and threw the malfunctioning remains into a top-secret facility. So consider this. If you have a dream, it is your right and your duty to stand tall, seize that dream, and make it your own, and bask when it comes to fruition. You don't do what 
what Stephen did and hide behind a mask to avoid the cold glare of criticism. You don't want that mask to take over and become who you truly are. One more thing. I know you're angry. But don't go seeking revenge on the Lucas droid. It's the greatest tragedy of all. It knows nothing of the damage it has done. Besides, you might get hurt. But his security's pretty tight down in Area 51. <laughs>